Let's begin back during the Taken King expansion of Destiny 1. When the Dreadnought first appeared in our solar system, stationed on the rings of Saturn, a Cabal Legion called Skyburners was sent over by Dominus Gaul. Their mission? To kill the Taken King, in revenge for an attack ordered by Oryx on a Cabal base on Phobos. During this invasion, the leader of the Cabal Skyburners Legion becomes taken by Oryx, so the Cabal's Shield Brothers mobilize to destroy the core of the Dreadnought. But, destroying the Dreadnought's core will trigger a massive destruction of a big chunk of our solar system. This is where the Vanguard assigned us to stop the Shield Brothers in a strike with the same name. We succeeded at stopping the two brothers in the strike, but the remainder of the Skyburner's Legion managed to send a detailed distress signal back to Dominus Gaul, giving him enough information about Oryx's death, the Dreadnought, the Guardians, and our light powers. This is when Gaul begins to develop the technology to isolate the Traveler with a light containment device, and even a way to extract it. Dominus Gaul had lived a very hard life, being abandoned as a child, rescued, raised, and trained by a stranger with the intention to someday take over the Cabal Empire from Kallus. He believed the Traveler had made a big mistake choosing Earth's humans, Exos, and Awoken as light bearers and guardians of the Traveler. He strongly believed the Cabal were a much more worthy race and would make much better warriors if they had the light. Two years passed since the Shield Brothers and the Taken King's defeat. Dominus Gaul and the Red Legion succeed at taking the last city by surprise, setting up the beginning of the Red War. Many lives were lost that day, our tower and our vault destroyed. But Gaul's intention wasn't just destruction. He needed as much information on the Traveler as possible, so he successfully takes the Speaker as a prisoner and begins interrogation. The Vanguard, in a desperate move, sent us immediately to Gull's command ship as Ikora searches for the Speaker. Our attempt fails, and we're introduced to Gull himself as he activates the light containment device attached to the Traveler, and we see our light fade away. Gull celebrates his victory roasting us and kicking us off the command ship in one of the most epic moments in Destiny history. Lightless, ghostless, and defeated, we crawl through the streets of the Lost City after taking a big fall from the command ship. Seeing Cabal marching on the streets, we manage to find our ghost. Still alive, but no longer able to revive us, he intersects a rendezvous signal coming from a few miles outside the city walls. And after an epic hike through the mountains listening to Journey, we manage to follow a falcon to meet Hawthorne and make it to the farm. The farm would be our home for Vanguard operations for a while. Here we meet Tyra Karn, another cryptarch like Rahul. Tyra Karn was our cryptarch back during Rise of Iron inside the Iron Temple. But now she's here and she informs us of visions she's had of a shard of a traveler that apparently has been right below the traveler since the collapse. It is a dangerous place since it attracts the fallen, but it's worth investigating. We reach the shard of the traveler and manage to regain our light powers. Gaul becomes aware of our light powers returning and continues interrogating the speaker. The more the speaker says, the more Gaul becomes unsure about taking the light by force. He now believes being chosen by the Traveler is the way to go, and he's determined to achieve it. Taking it by force would be a failure, and Gaul never fails. These interrogations lead to the speaker's death, but not before telling Gaul to kill himself. Moments later, we receive a signal from Titan. It's Commander Savala asking survivors to go to Titan to regroup and plan a counterattack. We find Zavala with Deputy Commander Sloan, and we're introduced to yet another threat, the Almighty. Gaul's precious weapon, Destroyer of Stars. The Almighty is currently aiming at our sun, and if things go south for Gaul, he would not hesitate to destroy the sun creating a supernova, wiping our solar system. So we must act fast, and find the rest of the Vanguard. Kate 6 learned about a Vex teleporter on Nessus that he could use to get up close and personal with Gaul put a bullet in his head, and then eat a sandwich, his words. So this is where we found Kate 6 and with the help of failsafe, the malfunctioning AI, we managed to free Kate from a Vex teleportation loop he's been trapped in for days. After freeing Kate, he informs us that Ikora most likely went to Io to look for answers. There she was, standing by the last place the Traveler touched, defeated, wondering what are Gaul's intentions, and what are the Cabal looking for on Io. We found out that Cabal were drilling for traces of light under the planet's surface, 
and after this discovery, we all head back to the farm to come up with a counterattack to retake the last city. With the full vanguard at the farm and the help of Hathorn, we agree on a dangerous plan that would see us first reaching the Almighty to disable its weapon and then sneaking back into the last city to confront Gaul. In order for us to make it to the Almighty undetected, we're going to need a Cabal ship. And in order to steal a Cabal ship, we're going to need to find the keys, or Cabal codes. So we head to the EDZ at a Cabal base to face one of Gaul's chosen, Thumos the Unbroken. We defeat Thumos and steal the Cabal ship. We make it to the Almighty, we get a nice tan, and find its main weapons vents. Blow up the vents and make an escape having successfully disabled the Almighty weapons. We're back in the last city. Zavala and friends are struggling to fight their way into the last city without the light. And when we reach them, they are in pretty bad shape. So it's up to us to take the Vex teleporter and get close to Gaul. Gaul is informed of the Almighty's condition and becomes desperate, so he begins the extraction of the light, forgetting about the initial idea of wanting to be chosen by the Traveler. We face a Gaul powered by the Traveler's light, and upon his defeat, the Traveler breaks through the light containment device and heals itself, melting Gaul with its light. A bright wave of light so powerful that it spreads throughout our system and beyond as the Traveler heals. So strong that it reaches the Black Fleet the pyramid ships on some corner of the universe. This was the moment at the very end of the Red War story campaign that the witness in the Black Fleet became aware of the Traveler being on Earth and began the hunt. The hunt that brought us here, so close to the end of the light and dark saga of Destiny 2. So who is Osiris? His exile, his relationship with Ikora, the Vanguard, Saint-14 and the Curse of Osiris story. Let's begin at some point after the Battle of the Six Fronts with the formation of the Vanguard and his exile. Saint-14, Osiris, and Andal Brask are the Vanguard. Ikora is Osiris' apprentice, Kate 6 is a bounty hunter doing his own thing out in the field, and the speaker is the creepy dictator preacher of the last city. Anything he says goes. Anything. Osiris began to gain a following among the people of the last city when he was pretty vocal about disagreeing with the speaker. The word started spreading about his research and his belief that the Traveler wasn't what we all thought. That the death of the Traveler when Nesarek, disciple of the Witness, attacked the last city during the Collapse was a blessing to humanity. Even though the Traveler created the ghost that gave humanity a second chance, it had brought so many enemies to our doorstep. The Fallen, the Hive, the Cabal, and the Vex. All these ideas conflicted with what the Speaker has been preaching to the people. But the Vex was the main interest for Osiris. As we all know, the Vex are our favorite time traveler space robots, and they have been trying to find the perfect timeline where they become the final shape, or the last one standing in the universe. Osiris became obsessed with studying the Vex, as he saw them as humanity's true enemy. To him, all other foes have a chance to tire and die. The Vex don't, they don't tire, and when killed they simply multiply. He believes the Vex are the only race we will have to fight for longer than forever. Forever is linear, he said. And the Vex are time travelers, complicating things even more and fueling his obsession. The speaker began to notice the growth of Osiris' following, even as Osiris did not want to have anything to do with him. The cultists began to twist his words, so Osiris thought the best way to avoid this was to write everything down. Ikora wasn't a fan of this idea, she thought anything he wrote would be treated as holy text. But Osiris saw himself as a researcher, offering the people of the last city with facts and truth, so he still went with it and wrote everything down in a book. This move backfired on Osiris, as copies of his prophecies, as the followers called them, were being sold on the streets of the last city, and this was the last straw for the speaker. Saint-14 tried to talk Osiris into not continuing his research on the Vex, and focus on protecting the last city as the warlock vanguard that he was, and also because the speaker was showing some concerns about Osiris. As Osiris was spending more and more time on his research, Ikora began to step in for vanguard duties to represent Osiris and the warlocks. At some point before the Battle of Twilight Gap, the vanguard received a message from Kate 6 about the location of the leader of the fallen House of Kings. It was our friend Tanix. But Osiris wasn't there to help come out with the plan upsetting the speaker. There's another great story there about Kate and Tanix and how he became the Hunter Vanguard, but that's for another video. 
The speaker had enough of Osiris' obsession and ordered every single book sold around the city to be retrieved and burned. Osiris was then exiled from the vanguard and the last city. This brings us to Mercury. The speaker becomes aware that Osiris is on Mercury and in fear that he might provoke the Vex, he sends Saint-14 to find Osiris and stop him. Saint-14 arrives on Mercury and enters the Infinite Forest where Osiris is believed to be spending most of his time researching. The Infinite Forest is a planet-sized prediction engine created by the Vex on Mercury where they are capable of exploring trillions of possible timelines so they can predict their enemies' every move and come out on top. Osiris has become a master at navigating the forest, but Saint-14 immediately gets lost in there, and ends up spending years fighting Vex looking for Osiris. He defeated countless Vex until the Vex figured out a way to create a Vex mine able to suppress his light, with the only purpose to defeat Saint. This is how Saint-14 died in the Infinite Forest, in some random timeline while looking for Osiris. We began our vanilla destiny story with Saint-14 dead, Osiris exiled on Mercury researching, and our new vanguard, Ikora, Zavala, and Kate 6 The speaker dies during the Red War invasion of the last city, at a point where many citizens had stopped believing his word, and he revealed before he died that the Traveler never spoke to him, but he spoke for the Traveler. Yeah, he was basically a fraud. The Curse of Osiris story begins with Osiris and Sagira exploring yet another timeline simulation soon after Gaul's defeat in the Red War, and the Traveler's burst of light that reach every corner of the universe. This time, Osiris sees something through a Vex portal, a dark future, and the Vex in the simulation become aware of Osiris' and Sagira's presence. The Vex have learned to sense light, most likely due to the light that reached them when the Traveler defeated Gaul. Osiris, in a desperate move, pushes Sagira through the portal and he stays behind fighting the Vex. One of Ikora's hidden agents finds Sagira on Mercury and brings her to Ikora, which to Ikora was bad news about her teacher, Osiris. So Ikora asks us to go to Mercury and find Osiris with hopes that he's alive and we can get him to come back to the last city now that the speaker's gone. We arrive and meet Brother Vance, one of the followers of Osiris and his biggest fan. He guides us to the entrance to the Infinite Forest, which is locked, of course, and we fight the Vex pouring in from different timelines, past, present, and future Vex. We clear the entrance to the lighthouse where Brother Vance is hiding, and he tells us that the followers of Osiris in a hidden temple on Earth must know a way to revive Sagira. We reach the radio tower where the temple is hidden, but the temple was attacked by the Fallen before we got there, and all the fans of Osiris killed. Ghost inspects a tablet and places Sagira in it. Sagira comes back and fuses with our ghost, temporarily. They were sharing the same ghost shell, she said. Now that we have Sagira guiding us, she tells us that Osiris saw something in the infinite forest that terrified him. She also explains that Osiris created copies of himself with Vex technology so he could explore multiple timelines at once, so we might run into these reflections of Osiris sooner or later. We begin to run into reflections constantly telling us that we shouldn't be there, that Vex can sense light and that puts everything Osiris has worked for in danger. But Sagira knows that without her, Osiris could die. The reflections of Osiris guide us through the infinite forest as they explain how Mercury went from being a garden world in the past, a paradise constructed by the Traveler, into a Vex prediction engine controlled by a single Vex, Panoptes. These reflections have been navigating countless timelines trying to find the one where we succeed at defeating Panoptes with no success. Next, we are shown the dark future Osiris saw. No light or dark, no life, the sun is dead, and the lighthouse is in ruins. Right before, we're introduced to Panoptes himself, and we escape that timeline. We head back to Ikora and we explain everything we found out about the forest, so she sends us to Io, to the Pyramidian Strike, where she believes the Vex must have some sort of map of the infinite forest. If we find this map, we'll know the location of Panoptes. We find the conflux to analyze at the end of the strike, and we find no map, but only coordinates for a node inside the infinite forest where Sagira believes we'll find the map. So we are back on Mercury, and now we have to deal also with Cabal there. Survivors of the Almighty, which makes sense since the Almighty was in relatively close proximity to the Sun and Mercury. In the infinite forest, looking for the node, we jump into the Tree of Probability strike, the Vex know we're looking for the map, so they're redirecting the Cabal in the simulation to destroy this map, so we can't find Panoptes. We meet Carthion, Archival Mind, the protector of the map. 
a Vex Minotaur right before we reach the map, who gets immediately destroyed by some Cabal dude dropping in. Valus Thun. This Cabal Centurion led an expedition into the Infinite Forest in the early days of the Red War, looking for the same map we're looking for. They got caught in a combat loop with the Vex and then manipulated by the Vex to destroy the map instead. We defeat him with no problem and reach the map, only for Sagira to realize she doesn't have enough power to search a constantly changing map. We need to look for Vex mines on Nessus to help us search the map. We search the map again on Nessus with no success. Akora then has the best idea, to look in the past instead of the future. Look for the code that created Panoptis in the past and then run a simulation forward in time. So we head back to the infinite forest, to the past this time, to the strike a garden world, where we can find the algorithm that created the infinite forest and Panoptis. We reach the end and we find the location of Panoptis who suddenly appears in that timeline, takes Agira and kicks us out of the forest. To get back into the forest, we seek the help of Ikora since we cannot open it without Sagira, and we rush to find Panoptis before Osiris does. We find Panoptis and as we're about to be deleted from the forest, the reflections of Osiris show up to help, providing us with arc charges to take down his defenses and defeat him. We exit the infinite forest to meet Ikora waiting for us, and we finally meet Osiris in game. Ikora and Osiris have their moment, we invite Osiris to come home with us, to which he declines, and goes back into the forest to keep researching the Vex and maybe find a way to bring back his partner Saint-14. It took some time for him to gather enough resources inside the forest to create a sundial and bring back Saint-14, but that's another story. Rasputin, Big Red, The Tyrant. Some of the names the Warmind has been given over the years. But who exactly is Rasputin? his creation and purpose, the collapse, his absence, and the events of the Warman expansion of Destiny 2 where we helped them stop a Worm God. Let's begin back during the Golden Age, an era in history around 700 years before the present day. We had made contact with the Traveler on Mars for the first time, and the Traveler began to terraform the different planets in our solar system, allowing for humanity to colonize it in its entirety. Humanity was thriving with the advances in technology we had learned from the Traveler. Clovis Bray was the scientist responsible for many of the scientific advances we see today, even after the collapse. He funded the Clovis Bray Exoscience Corporation with his son Clovis Bray II and his grandkids, Alton, Willa, Elizabeth, and Anastasia. Alton wasn't a scientist, but holding an executive role in the corporation. Willa had similar beliefs as Grandpa Clovis. They believed Siva was the answer to immortality and she is responsible for the invention of the engram. Elizabeth was a weapons and ships engineer up until she joined Grandpa Clovis on Europa to help develop the exo program in the Deepstone Crypt. And Anna Bray. She was a psycholinguist and helped the development of the Warmind Rasputin, teaching it independent thought. And Russian. She died during the collapse. Rasputin began as a safety and diagnostics AI created pre-Golden Age, known simply as R, to help with the first Mars exploration missions. His duty was basic diagnostics like checking oxygen and fuel. With time and the beginning of the Golden Age, Clovis Bray took the code for R and implemented it into an interplanetary defense system, becoming Rasputin, the most powerful military intelligence ever developed. This is when Anna Bray assisted by teaching Rasputin language, uploading a massive amount of literature, philosophy, and music into his database. Rasputin's main core programming during the Golden Age was to protect humanity and come up with a solution to any threat in the horizon. His reach spreads throughout the entire system with the help of other submines created after him and located in other planets like the one on Earth, the Moon, and Io. He also created an EXO with the sole purpose to go out into the world and interact with humans and collect information about them, like customs, culture, and behavior. This EXO was killed during the collapse and will later become a guardian. Fell winter, but that could be its own video, there's so much there. Rasputin was the first to know the collapse was coming. We now know the collapse was brought to us by Nesarek, disciple of the witness, chasing after the traveler. Every action Rasputin had taken up to this point to prevent the collapse had failed, or had a 100% chance of failing with the arrival of the darkness. 
So when he determined there was nothing he could do to prevent it, he rewrote his own core programming code from protection of humanity to long-term survival, having himself and submines going dark, dormant, presumed dead. Even after Rasputin left humanity to fend for themselves, he placed an emergency protocol in case the Traveler ever attempted to escape and leave humanity to extinction. He would fire with all of his power at the Traveler, weakening him and forcing him to stay, protect humanity and protect himself. Of course, Rasputin had the knowledge of what the Traveler did to the Elixni before. The collapse came, Nesorek invaded, death and destruction, the Traveler, protecting himself, blasted Nesorek and his pyramid ship with such power that killed Nesorek and his pyramid ship crashed into the moon. The Traveler, wounded after the attack, attempts to leave Earth and Rasputin Emergency Protocol kicks in, shooting the Traveler with all his power to prevent him from leaving. And it worked. The Traveler, on his last breath, creates and releases ghosts to search for worthy corpses to rise from the dead and become guardians of the Traveler while the Traveler is weak and dormant. Anna Bray died during the collapse, but was resurrected by a ghost some time after. Even though new Guardians Risen have no memories of their past lives, Anna Bray died wearing her name badge, Dr. Anastasia Bray, Clovis Bray Exoscience Corporation, which gave her enough information to find out her past. A past that brings her to Mars looking for the Clovis Bray facility and a dormant Rasputin. The Traveler has spent many years inactive until Gaul forced him to wake up during the Red War. Guardians fought the Hive and Crota on the moon, fought Oryx on the Dreadnought, and helped Lord Saladin when the Fallen stole Siva and enhanced himself in the Plaguelands. But when the Traveler woke, the powerful blast of light that reached every corner of the universe also reached Sol, the Worm God on Mars. But how did the Worm God end up on Mars? Okay, hear me out, it's a bit complicated. When Oryx went down beneath the Fundament to meet with Akka, one of the Wormbats, and ended up killing Akka and creating the Tablets of Ruin which gave him the power to take, Zol became afraid that the other worm god Yule, would turn against him to kill him and become powerful enough to fight Oryx. Zol made a pact with Nocris, the exiled son of Oryx and brother of Crota. Together they left Fundament to find a new home, which was Mars, during the collapse. Rasputin, while dormant, detected Zol and Nocris attempting to corrupt the core of the planet. So a defense mechanism activated that flash froze a big chunk of the planet, trapping Zol, Nocris, and all the Hive in ice. They stayed frozen until after the Red War and the awakening of the Traveler. The ice began to melt, exposing Hive Redmans, which triggered another defense mechanism from Rasputin, crashing warsats all over the area to try and contain the Hive defrosting. And this is the beginning of the Warman expansion. Warsats crashing all over, Anna Bray fights through the frosted Hive as she tries to reach the Clovis Bray facility to find out more about her past and Rasputin. This is when she contacted us asking for help. She knows about the Hive and the danger if they get to Rasputin. We land on Mars, we reach Anna, and head over to the Clovis Bray facility. She accesses a terminal to unlock the path to Rasputin's core, and we head there next. Fighting through hordes of Hive, we reach Rasputin's core as he activates the Valkyrie for us to use it in defending it. We clear the area and meet with the very upset Zavala inside. Hello, Guardian. Oh, Shanks. What do you think you're doing? Do you have any idea how dangerous this thing is? Rasputin is Vanguard business, Anastasia, not yours. You do not belong here. You don't understand the connection I share with Rasputin. Here, let me show you. Okay. Rasputin was not the only thing to awaken on Mars. Anna and Zavala know about Zol and the pact the Hive made with the Worm Gods, so in order to lure Zol out, we need some bait. Zavala thinks of a fragment of the Traveler that's on the EDZ. It landed there after Gol's attack, and it would be really hard for Zol to resist it. So we head over to the EDZ to retrieve this fragment of the Traveler and bring it back to Mars. The fragment is guarded by Taken with a Taken shield on it, so Anna uses one of Rasputin warsats in orbit 
to take the shield down and we get it back to Mars. The next step is to find Zol's feeding place, so we begin the search down in the caverns. A variation of the strange terrain strike. We reach the end, meet Nocris, and place the lure after we defeat him. Zol shows up and wants to have words with us. We learn that Sol is headed towards Rasputin Neural Network, so it's time for the Will of the Thousand Strike. We end Sol with the power of the Valkyrie and head back to have a chat with Rasputin. And that concludes the Warman expansion. Since then, we had the Season of the Worthy with Rasputin kept tracking the Pyramid ships approaching. And we did millions of Seraph Tower public events to help him create satellites to stop the Almighty from crashing on the last city. The season ended on an epic live event of Rasputin shooting down the Almighty. Then the pyramids arrived and took over half of her destinations including Mars. As Anna Bray escaped Mars, she took whatever was left of Rasputin inside of an engram before he was completely shut down by the witness. As of the making of this video, Anna Bray is still working on getting Rasputin back, hopefully into an exobody. Light on one side, dark on the other. Where do you stand? The Forsaken Story Aldrin Sov, the Scorn Barons, and the final days of our beloved Kate 6. This story campaign began with the Prison Break in the Prison of Elders. But how did it happen? Who was involved? And what exactly triggered the events of the Forsaken Story of Destiny 2? Let's begin a few years back during the Taken War of Destiny 1. The Queen of the Awoken, Mara Sov, and her Tekians are declared dead after Oryx the Taken King released a massive shockwave from the Dreadnought. Aldrin Sov, brother of the Queen, survives the blast, crashing his ship on Mars, and becomes obsessed with the idea that his sister's still alive. In the Reef, Petra Venge, the Queen's Wrath, and Varix the Loyal oversee the Prison of Elders, while Queen Mara's missing. This facility is known to contain members of the House of Wolves, Hive, Vex, and Cabal who have attacked the Reef. Varix had followed many houses throughout his life. He was a member of the House of Judgment and later became loyal to Queen Mara. After the Traveler abandoned the Elixni and House Judgment fell to ruin, Varix seek refuge with the House of Wolves where he met Fikru, who will eventually become the Fanatic. Fikru was exiled from the House of Wolves for speaking against the Traveler and then created his own house, House of Exile. They would call themselves the Scorn Barons. Aldrin Sov spent his days after the Taken War searching for anything that would point him in the direction of his missing sister. He even founded the House of Dusk to raise an army of Fallen to help the search. And after a while, Aldrin's overwhelming desire to hear from Queen Mara again was heard by none other than the Wish Dragon Riven of a Thousand Voices. Riven the Wish Dragon played a big part in the Forsaken campaign. She helped Mara Sov create the Dreaming City but was a dangerous creature, so Mara wished that it be trapped at the keep in the heart of the city where it could do no harm. After the Taken War, where Queen Mara disappeared, Oryx and the Taken infiltrated the Dreaming City and took Riven. Oryx was killed by the Guardian soon after, and Savathun came to bargain with Riven. Riven wanted to be free from the keep and the Dreaming City, but all Savathun could offer was to extend her reach. This is how Riven was able to reach Aldrin outside of the Dreaming City and corrupt his mind, tricking him with visions of his lost sister, all with the intention to get Aldrin to unseal the Dreaming City and free Riven. Sometime after, while in his search for Mara, corrupted by Riven, Aldrin runs into a dying Fikru and wishes that he could save him. The wish was heard by Riven and granted by infusing some of Aldrin's darkness with Fikru's ether, dark ether that raised Fikru into the first ever scorn. This is why the fanatic calls Aldrin father. Not only was Fikru back, but now also has the power to raise other Elixni into Scorn with his Dark Aether. So he got himself an army of undead Scorn and seven barons. A year after the Red War, Aldrin, Fikru, and the barons were captured by Kate 6 and Petra Venge and taken to the Prison of Elders. 
While in his prison cell, Aldrin started playing mind games with Varix, asking about where his true loyalty lied. And after a few encounters with Aldrin, Varix made a plan to leave the prison of elders, so he programmed his warden servitor, the warden of nothing from the strike, to deliver messages to any Elixni who wished to join his house judgment, and to begin a reset of the prison unlocking every single cell. And this was the last we heard from Varix the Loyal, and then the prison break happened. Kate Six and the Guardian are called back to assist Petra Venge with the prison break, and while we fight our way to security, Petra has a bigger concern, so she goes straight to the higher security levels to find out that yes, Aldrin Sov, Fikru, and the Barons have escaped. Petra informs Kate Six that they most likely will escape at the lowest level of the prison, so Kate, playing the hero, rides the entire security room down to the lowest level where he is met by the Scorn Barons. Surrounded and alone, Sundance, Kate Six Ghost gets killed by the Rifleman while she attempted to heal Kate. She goes in a burst of light that reaches us a few floors above, as we rush down to assist Kate. Kate meets his end in one of the most epic and heartbreaking cutscenes in Destiny history. We make it down to Kate, and as Aldrin and the Barons leave the Prison of Elders, Kate gives us his last words. Tells Zavala and Ikora, the Vanguard was the best bet I ever lost. Back at the tower, Zavala and Ikora say goodbye to Kade, and Ikora delivers a super emotional performance. Full of rage and thirsty for vengeance, calls Zavala a coward for not wanting to do anything about Kade's death. All Zavala cares for now is not losing any more friends and protecting the last city and its people. So we take on the task to put an end to Aldrin's off. Zavala tells us that anything we do is on our own, and that the Vanguard won't help us. Ikora, on the other hand, talks smack on Savala one more time before she sends us to the Tangled Shore where we can find Aldrin Sov. Back in the reef, Aldrin offers the Tangled Shore to the Barons and Fikru as payment for their loyalty. Creating problems for the Spider and the Elixni in the Tangled Shore, Aldrin listens to Mara illusions created by Riven and burn the Queen's throne. We land on the Tangled Shore and meet Petra at the Spider's hideout. Spider knows where Aldrin and the Barons hide, so we make an agreement with the Spider since we all have the same goal, get rid of Aldrin and the Barons. Spider leads us to the Hollow Lair, where we believe we can end all Barons at once. We meet with the Machinist, the Rifleman, the Hangman, and the Fanatic, but they all escape and spread out. So the Spider invites us over for tea so he can tell us more about the 8 Barons we need to chase. Petra knows that the main reason why Aldrin went to the Tango Shore is to access the Awoken Watchtower and unseal the Dreaming City, so we must stop him before he does. Our first Baron target was the Rider, Yavix the Rider, the leader of a gang of Pike Riders. Next, we search a cave for Canix, the Mad Bomber, the Demolitions Expert. The Hangman, Rexis Vaughn, enjoys causing pain, known for pulling off the arms of Drex with his bare hands. Then we chase the Trickster. Araxis, a liar and a schemer, can't trust anything she touches, heavy ammo bricks blow up in your face. Next Baron was Hyrax, the Mindbender, one of the most important Barons, manipulation and an obsession with the Hive, Hive magic and creating his own throne world like Oryx and Savathun. Throne worlds are made basically by killing powerful beings, and during this encounter we go into the Mindbender's throne world, which he obtained by killing Cade. We finish the Mindbender, destroy his throne world, and move on to the next Baron. Pira, the Rifleman, responsible for the death of Sundance, Kate's ghost. Next was the Machinist, Elikris, right hand of the Fanatic, expert on tech and heavy armament. But while we're doing this, our friend Aldrin visits the Shard of the Traveler in the EDZ and gets a hold of a piece of it, listening to Riven asking him to use the power of the Shard of the Traveler to unseal the Dreaming City. We now know that Aldrin is on his way to the Watchtower where he plans to unseal the entrance to the Dreaming City and free Riven, using the Traveler Crystal. Which led us to the fanatic himself, Fikro, the father of the Scorn and the one who never dies. He was left by Aldrin guarding the entrance to the Dreaming City, so we defeat him for the first time, first of many, right there at the gates of the Dreaming City. We go in and immediately notice the Dreaming City is full of Taken, Taken forces now commanded by Riven the Taken Wish Dragon, but originally brought here by Oryx the Taken King. We rush to stop Aldrin from freeing Riven, but we're too late and Riven sends out one of his voices, the Meatball, Chimera, who eats Aldrin immediately. We defeat the Chimera and are left wondering who pulled the trigger on Aldrin, the Guardian or Petrovench. 
And these are the events of the Forsaken campaign. There's so much more that followed right after this, which is tied to the Last Wish raid. I thank you all for your viewership, my name is Tavius Place, and if you'd like to watch other informative Destiny videos, you can click here.